Section 3 of the Spiritual Maxims of Brother Lawrence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Of how it is required of us to worship God in spirit and in truth. There are three points in this question which must be answered. To worship God in spirit and in truth means to offer Him the worship that we owe. God is a spirit and therefore we must worship Him in spirit and in truth. That is to say, by presenting to Him a true and humble spiritual worship in the very depth of our being. God alone can see this worship, which, offered unceasingly, will in the end become as it were natural, and as if He was one with our soul, and our soul one with Him. Practice will make this clear. To worship God in truth is to acknowledge Him to be what He is, and ourselves as what in very fact we are. To worship Him in truth is to acknowledge with heartfelt sincerity what in truth God is, that is to say, infinitely perfect, worthy of infinite adoration, infinitely removed from sin, and so of all the divine attributes. That man is little guided by reason, who does not employ all his powers to render this great God the worship that is his due. Furthermore, to worship God in truth is to confess that we live our lives entirely contrary to his will, and contrary to our knowledge that, were we but willing, he would fain make us comfortable to him. Who will be guilty of such folly as to withhold, even for a moment, the reverence and the love, the service and the unceasing worship that we owe him? Of the union of the soul with God There are three degrees of union of the soul with God. The first degree is general. The second is virtual union, and the third is actual union. That degree of union as the general which one finds when the soul is united by God solely by grace. Virtual union, which is in effect union though not in fact, is our state when, beginning any action by which we are united to God, we remain so united to Him by reason of that action and for such time as it lasts. Actual union is the perfect union. In the other degrees, the soul is passive, almost as if it were slumbering. In this actual union, the soul is intensively active. Quicker than fire are its operations, more luminous than the sun, unobscured by any passing cloud. Yet we can be deceived as to this union by our own feelings. It is not a mere fleeting emotion, such as would prompt a passing cry, My God, I love thee with my heart's full strength. It is rather a state of soul, if I can but find the words, which is deeply spiritual and very simple, which fills us with a joy that is calm indeed and with a love that is very humble and very reverent, which lifts the soul heights where the sense of the love of God constrains it to adore Him, to embrace Him, with a tenderness that cannot be expressed and experience alone can teach us to understand. All who aspire to a union with the divine should know that whatever can gladden the will is in fact pleasing to it, or at least so the will reckons it. There is no one but must avow that God is beyond understanding. To be united to Him, it is needful therefore to deny the will all tastes and pleasures, bodily and spiritually, that being thus detached, it can be free to love God above all things. For if the will can in any measure come to know God, it can do so only through love. The difference is great between the tastes and sentiments of the will and its working. 
since the wills tastes and sentiments are in the soul as in their bounds whilst its working which is properly love finds its soul end in god end of section three